Hi folks. So uh, considering that I've got this uh, channel here on YouTube where I talk quite a lot about Linux and the benefits thereof, you might be forgiven for thinking that I evangelize it quite a lot in my day-to-day -day life among my friends and family and, and colleagues and the like. But the truth is that I, I don't. Well, not very much at least. Um, everyone who knows me uh, reasonably well will know that I'm a big Linux fan, but I have this rule when it comes to selling Linux to other people, and that's not to do it unless I can guarantee that they'll get what they're looking for out of the experience. So we all make our distribution choices based on all kinds of factors. Uh, some make their decision based on software availability, some make it based on privacy, some people like a distribution that they can customize, some people like the open source free software model. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's all different kinds of reasons. And the most common reason I find uh, helps people with Linux in the day-to-day, -day, you know, sort of non-tech sphere, is using Linux to revive old machines. Yeah, uh, from time to time, people will come to me asking for recommendations on, on what laptops to buy, what hardware to buy, all that kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of people come to me with a laptop that's, what, like four years old, and they'll say that it's running slow and um, that they're considering buying a new one, and I'll ask them for their budget, and, uh, you know, that'll vary, but uh, but most people will, will tend to pay for a uh, something in the ballpark of an entry-level laptop, laptop, because a lot of people, you know, don't use laptops for high-level things, um, or at least the people that I talk to on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of people will use them for office work most of the time. So that's, you know, word processing and, and browsing the internet. For the most part, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very simple system that a lot of people are using. Uh, sometimes they'll need things like Skype and, and video chat and uh, and that kind of stuff. And, and you need a certain level of um, performance out of that hardware, especially nowadays, considering uh, the kind of requirements that they have. But uh, by far the most successful... Uh, reason for getting people I know onto Linux is to extend the life of their hardware. No one wants to shelve out 500 quid or, or whatever to uh, to buy a new uh, piece of hardware when they can put it off for a couple of years. And um, and I do that, you know, from time to time. Whenever people come to me asking for for hardware recommendations, I'll just say, you know, you don't have to spend all that money right away um, if you're only using the browser and if you're only using Office software and maybe the occasional Skype meeting and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, Linux has that covered quite easily, and you know, I'll just put a uh, usually some sort of Ubuntu-based distribution on because it has widespread support um, and it's usually broadly quite user-friendly. The you know, and, and it's quick to install out of the box. Mint is often quite good, but uh, I think broadly speaking, my go-to is Ubuntu Mate. It has a wonderful software center. It's reasonably lightweight. It has uh, support for a lot of mod uh, modern features um, with uh, with hardware, that kind of stuff. Uh, also very customizable, so you can switch out things like the window manager very easily. You can customize compositing. So Ubuntu Mate usually is, is quite a good fit because it you can quite easily tailor it to the hardware hardware that it's running on. Uh, but failing that, I've also used Lubuntu, I've used Linux Mint, um, I've even used actually Manjaro on, um, on on one particular occasion for someone who wanted um, something slightly newer in regards to the, to the software. And, um, and I must say, for the most part, that that's been a very, very successful tactic. Um, but yeah, for the most part, there's only so many people you can help at a time. So I don't tend to try and sell Linux to, to anyone who isn't necessarily looking for it because I'm just going to respect their software choices. And actually, uh, in, in recent years running this channel, I've actually ran into Windows evangelists, which I didn't really consider, to be honest, because I always considered Windows to be the default choice. When you don't really care for a choice, you'll just take the one that most people have, this, you know, the, the industry standard, the one that comes uh, on your laptop, and that's almost always Windows. And if Windows does everything that they want it to do, then why try and fix something for them that's not broken? Um, yeah, of course, there are plenty of, of reasons to use Linux even if Windows has uh, everything you've got covered from an, you know, a, a short-term uh, pragmatic standpoint. But 
again, that's just uh, <laughs> making a lot of work for myself when I when I you know offer support, offer help uh, to them. Because, uh, like I said, I'm not going to uh, try and uh, sell someone onto Linux unless I can guarantee a good experience, and that does mean basically being on the other end of a phone in case something goes wrong. So you know, I, I keep the number of people who I can offer that kind of help to uh, you know as, as limited as possible. Um, so to only people who are actually sort of genuinely interested in in Linux in one capacity or another, either from a practical standpoint or possibly from an ideological one. Now, those people that tend to seek out Linux on the basis of, of you know, its technical merits, it, its, its, you know, sort of ideological merits of like the free software movement and all that kind of stuff, those uh, people are uh, a lot more sort of enthusiastic to to learn uh, new ways of doing things, to read manuals, to engage in a community. Um, but uh, for your person on the street who's not really uh, involved in the tech sector, they kind of want as little to do with the operating system on their computer as possible. And fortunately enough, Linux is pretty good at, at both of those. So Anyway, what's this uh, coming around to? Well, uh, a friend of mine actually recently acquired a laptop for free. Um, basically, it was otherwise going to be thrown out. And they said, well, you know, um, have a look at it, see what you can do. Don't, you know, put any, don't upgrade it or don't spend any money on it. Just, um, you know, try and fix it up best you can. And if you can't, it'll just go in the bin, no loss. So the laptop, I've got it here. It's an Advent laptop. now. I'm not used to an Advent laptop because you see, I've been using Linux as my primary distribution now for since 2006. That's about 12 years as a full-time Linux user, and I start and I picked it up for the first time in 1997, and um, and that uh, that's when um, you know that was a very sort of um, light you know sort of uh, foray into it. It was really it was really around sort of 2006 that I sort of used Linux as a full-time uh, distribution. And since then, I always bought my hardware for Linux. So I always just searched on the internet for hard, you know, hardware that was compatible with it. So hardware compatibility has not really been an issue for me on Linux for a long, long, long time because there's plenty of available hardware that works on Linux. The problem usually comes when you've got something that you're used to running with Windows and then you switch over to Linux, and Linux might not necessarily have the best support for it for one reason or another. Usually it's down to the nature of the drivers uh, being proprietary. So anyway, I've got this. This is an Advent laptop. Now it's very, very old. It's got one gig of RAM. In fact, what I'll do is I'll put a screenshot up now of the specification. So you can have a look at it. You can see what I was working with. Uh, it has, of course, a spinny disk. Um, and it's an Advent 5311. Came with Windows Vista on it, but when I turned it on for the first time, it actually um, had Windows 7. So whoever was using it um, did give themselves an upgrade. Um, but it is an, it is a pretty old laptop, all things considered, and um, I had to uh, consider what kind of distribution was I going to run on it because. Well, I've got a uh, list of CDs here because this is actually a laptop with, with a CD, CD drive and it actually came with a few issues. I'm going to talk a little bit about the issues that I had with it today because, um, you know, it's just to sort of really sort of reflect on some of the challenges that maybe a lot of people coming over to Linux from Windows might have to experience and also because quite frankly I had a great time fixing this up. It was a nice little project and it got me to look at Linux through a slightly different lens. So the first problem that I actually found with this laptop is that it didn't boot from USB drives and I'm not entirely sure why and I still actually haven't worked out um, a, a specific solution to that. Um, it actually reads USBs perfectly fine um, at, at the speed that you would expect a USB to be read at. No problem from that standpoint. But for some reason, it just didn't like booting from a USB. There could be a few reasons for that. I looked through the BIOS. There didn't seem to be anything in the BIOS that indicated it. The BIOS detected the USBs when they were plugged in, just not the operating system on there. It just sort of ignored it and then just moved on to the next thing in the, in the boot sequence. Now, my suspicion for that is probably down to how uh, the bootloaders work on, on USBs nowadays, and it might not necessarily be compatible with that specific piece of hardware or uh, from that specific time. Now, I could very well be wrong here. However, my rather easy workaround was to simply uh, burn the uh, Linux distributions to, uh, to CDs here and, uh, and work with it. Now, I've actually got a small stack of CDs because I actually tried quite a few distributions out. 
Um, so what have I got? I got um, I got Zubuntu. I've got Linux Mint 19 Cinnamon. Uh, that wasn't gonna <laughs> that wasn't gonna fly. Um, oh, I've got Zubuntu, but I've got the 32-bit version there. So I was playing around 32-bit versus 64-bit. I got the uh, Man ooh, Manjaro XFCE 64-bit there. Uh, what have I got there? I've got uh, the KDE version of Manjaro because the thing is with with uh, the KDE version of Ma or KDE recently, it's been really, really quite good at. Um, uh, at, well, just being efficient, being a very efficient desktop environment. And if you have a slow uh, computer, if you have a you know a, a sort of a low spec machine, uh, KDE Plasma can actually sort of tailor itself to to work quite well with that machine. Um, and um, I've seen it run on less than a gig of RAM quite comfortably, which is uh, you know that's that's pretty decent. Um, what I've got here as well, I got oh Lubuntu. And that was uh, that was certainly a top contender because I've had a lot of success with Ubuntu in the past. It's uh, basically it's, it's Ubuntu, but with of course the LXDE desktop environment. Now they're moving over to LXQT, and I have had a look at that, and um, I'll probably end up doing a video looking at, uh, at the LXQT version of Ubuntu uh, sometime soon as well. Um, I've been playing around with it in a virtual machine, and it's really quite nice actually. I knew that it'd be quite good because I remember Ubuntu Next from last year, and that was really quite good. Also, there is, I believe, there is a Fedora respin with LXQT, and that that is uh, quite nice as well when I last tried it, and I do believe there is a review on this channel. I also tried Linux Lite 4.0. Um, that's based on Ubuntu. So yeah, the, the, there is a common theme. Apart from the Manjaro-based distributions, um, they're all Ubuntu-based. Now, uh, there is this, uh, well, I'm commonly told that um, Debian runs a lot lighter than Ubuntu, despite, of course, Ubuntu being based on Debian. Um, I've heard this specifically, actually, is on the Linux Mint website when they're comparing the Linux Mint Debian edition to the Linux Mint standard edition, which is based on Ubuntu. And they say one of the benefits of running Linux Mint Debian edition is that because it's based on Debian, it's just a little faster to run. Um, also, I hear a lot of people talking about MX Linux, which is based on Debian, not Ubuntu, and also doesn't use system D. Um, and there were a significant number of recommendations for that. And I have tried MX Linux before, uh, even on this channel on my uh, Entraware laptop, and I was very, very happy with it. Um, it's a good uh, distribution. So um, I tried all of these and I arrived, unsurprisingly, at Lubuntu, first of all, thinking that this was about as good a fit as, as I was really going to get. Now, the th great thing about Ubuntu is that it has, one, it has pretty good hardware support. Um, there are very, very, very few machines that I've ever come across, if any, where Ubuntu hasn't managed to run on in one capacity or another. However, there is a catch with this laptop, with Advent laptops. And if you look at Advent laptops on the net when it comes to um, fixing them up, you'll notice that they're generally not considered the most Linux-friendly machines. Now, people do try tend to find ways around this, but there is one thing about this machine. That, well, there are a few. Well, there are two things about this machine. Once I managed to get it booting into a live CD environment, there were two things that um, two hurdles that I had to get over. Uh, and I'm not uh, and I'm, I'm not immediately talking about the limited hardware functionality. I'm talking, first off, the wireless didn't work. Uh, that's something that I'm sure many of us have come up against once or twice in our experience with Linux. However, I haven't found that, you know, that's, that's a rarity for me. Uh, and it uses a, um, I'm gonna actually just refer to the, uh, the screen here for the chipset. The graphical chipset that it has is the SIS Mirage 3 integrated graphics, 256 megabytes shared. And then that's not a good graphics card. And what's worse about that graphics card is that it's not only incredibly poorly supported with proprietary drivers, apparently there are a lot of people on Windows who have problems keeping that uh, maintained as well. Um, because basically the it seems that the drivers were basically shipped out of the door and then forgotten about. Uh, especially the Linux drivers, which there are some people, when I asked for, for some help over on Mastodon, and thank you most kindly for those of you guys who were offering suggestions and ideas for uh, what I could do with this laptop. Um, a lot of you guys pointed me in the direction of old archives of um, proprietary drivers for this SIS Mirage 3. Uh, unfortunately, I really didn't have 
to much um, success with it. So, um, and and it did seem that a lot of the drivers, it they seemed old, they seemed antiquated, they were certainly unmaintained, and, and they didn't really feel all that safe just pulling down a proprietary piece of, um, you know, uh, code from the internet from a third party source. It felt a very tenuous solution, you know. Uh, so I went with the open source implementation of it, and I had to use the VESA drivers uh, in order for it to, to work. Um, now, it didn't run particularly wonderfully. However, I was told at every turn that the Linux proprietary drivers didn't run very well either. So I kind of felt that I was resigned to the fact that this was not going to be a graphical powerhouse, that this was going to be something that would probably struggle on something as mundane as a YouTube video. So I decided to go with the VESA drivers that come with whatever Linux distribution that it was that I was eventually going to land on. Because it came, you know, it, w it was, uh, you know, open source, came with the distribution, um, and is, you know, maintained, basically. It's not some sort of antiquated third party, uh, you know, piece of code that someone's long since forgotten about. And in fact, many of the places that claimed to keep the modern drivers uh, the proprietary drivers for this card ended up I, I ended up with a whole bunch of 404 errors actually tracking down the proprietary drivers at all was actually rather difficult and i think i might even very well have given up before just going with the vesa drivers now there was a trade-off with this now the vesa drivers actually ended up working reasonably pretty well all things considered it, 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 it is it is only it does only have 256 megabytes um of uh, of graphical memory there so like i say it ain't go, you know. It ain't going to be wonderful, and the Vesa drivers did seem to do quite well. But the trade-off was that I was stuck with the four-three aspect ratio on a widescreen monitor. So I don't know if you guys have ever come across this, but when you have a four by three resolution, which came out at um, ten twenty-four by seven sixty-eight, it was stretched across the widescreen wide screen monitor. Now, in all honesty, I could live with this. Like I say, this is a, a computer that would otherwise have been thrown in the rubbish. And would be, you know, and, and, and given that I could revive it, would be used as a, a last resort, a backup computer if there was some kind of, you know, word processing fiasco and, oh no, my computer's broken, but I need to get this report in on time, or I need to check something on the internet and this is the only device I've got, which probably is not necessarily a scenario that we'll see too often these days, given the abundance of smartphones and any other manner of, um, you know, internet connected device. But yeah, I'm looking at this advent as a backup machine. And in the event of an emergency, I could live with a stretched out uh, widescreen resolution on what would other, you know, what would otherwise be a widescreen monitor. And that would have been the only benefit I'd have got from actually getting the proprietary drivers. And then that's assuming that I could have installed them. And that's assuming that they would work on newer versions of um, Ubuntu or, or, you know, the other distributions and all that kind of stuff. So I went with the, the VESA drivers, even though the 4x3 resolution seemed to be here to stay. I could have done something to maybe have forced it, or I, you know, I could have gone into XRandar or something like that. But I wanted to keep the whole process as simple as possible because um, I probably wasn't going to get my hands on this computer very often from time to time because it's a backup machine that's of very low importance. So I wanted the setup process to be as simple as possible and as repli re replicable as possible as well. So all right, I'd live with that. And uh, as I said earlier, the second hurdle I had was uh, was Wi-Fi. Now it just turned out that the uh, on the advent, and I'm not really going to get this out to show you, but there is actually a switch that turns off uh, on and off the Wi-Fi. Um, pretty, um, it's not a hard switch, but it's rather close because n uh, none of the wi the wireless just didn't get picked up it just it was almost like there was no wireless device and the thing is there isn't anything on this machine to indicate that it even has wireless and it's pretty darn old now given that it has windows uh, windows vista on it uh, and 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 taking into account the time frame it almost certainly did have it but i didn't sort of consider that at the time this is old this is a rather rubbish laptop maybe it was pre wi-fi especially if it was a particularly cheap model. But no, it just turned out I didn't turn the hard switch on, <laughs> which was a bit silly of me because that was like, uh, it took me ages to work that one out. Um, but yeah, so uh, it just turned out that um, with a little bit of maneuvering, I actually managed to get pretty much full functionality out of that laptop sans the, the resolution stretch. 
So then I came on to uh, problem number two, which was actually finding a modern distribution that would run on such old hardware. The biggest challenges that I came up across, uh, came up against was the slow hard disk and of course the limited graphics capability. The uh, CPU in it actually wasn't too bad. Uh, it wasn't particularly wonderful. It took a while for applications to load up and what have you. Also, the one gigabyte uh, of RAM. I think it's one gigabyte or certainly thereabouts. It might be a little bit less memory. Yeah, one gigabyte of DDR2 RAM. So uh, that was also quite limiting on a lot of uh, newer Linux distributions, especially when it comes to desktop environments that weren't uh, lightweight ones. So yeah, this is why I went through all my stack. And um, I tried Lubuntu, well, I tried many of the others, and then I ended up on Lubuntu and I thought, this is not bad. This is really actually quite good. The LXDE desktop environment, which was the one that I had, it was the, it was 1804.1. Uh, uh, and it didn't, I'm not going to say it ran snappy, but it ran about as good as I was uh, I was hoping for, that I, it ran as well as I was expecting. I could get Firefox up and running. I could get a YouTube video running. It wasn't exactly running at, um, you know, with wonderful performance, but it was... Um, but it was running, and you could hear it okay as well. And um, and the graphic, the sound actually came through loud and clear when we tested it on um, Windows 7, and actually the speakers just sounded horrible. So we even actually got a bit of functionality with Linux that we didn't get uh, with Windows as well, which was which which was quite useful. And the good thing about Lubuntu as well is that it's very user it's very easy to use. You, you you know you click the start menu, you go through to either you know internet or graphics or, or you know office or whatever it is, and you select the application that you want. Now it came with Abbey Word, so I put on LibreOffice as well. LibreOffice was actually you know it was usable. It was perfectly usable actually. Um, as well as, of course, Abbey Word and Numeric, you know, so you got a bit of a choice as well. Um, and the, the actual hard disk, as slow as it was, actually is, I believe, it's around 100 gigabytes. So, you know, plenty of space there to uh, to run a lightweight distribution on. But it still took two to three minutes to boot up, and it still, you know, took, I don't know, 10 to 20 seconds to open up an application, and it was, oh, you know, it was hardly selling Linux, right? It was... You know, it was hardly, you know, showing Linux reviving uh, this, you know, antiquated piece of machinery. So I had a look around and I did try Linux Lite, but Linux Lite, of course, is being based on Ubuntu. And Ubuntu, hmm, you know, as wonderful as Ubuntu is, I think it's an absolutely wonderful piece of technology. For hardware this old, you know, it's, or hardware this rubbish, <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it's perhaps not the greatest fit. So... After a fair number of recommendations, um, and of course a, a a good personal experience, I decided to go with try out today. In fact, because I was I was about to send this back with Lubuntu on it as a usable laptop, but then I got curious, and then you know your guys' recommendations started digging at me. It's like, well, I couldn't in good conscience hand this laptop back without at least giving MX Linux a shot. People are always singing its praises, and for good reason. It's a really good distribution. Easy to use, incredibly lightweight, as it turned out. And it's one of those distributions. It's its own distribution. It has its own vision, and it does things its own way. And you, you've got to admire distributions that actually try and break out a little bit from the mold like that, uh, that don't necessarily you know, work in lockstep with, with every other uh, distribution out there. It offers something a little bit different with the common technological base, which I think is absolutely wonderful. So I got 13.1, the 32-bit version, straight off the website there, uh, loaded onto a CD. Even the live CD was pretty sharp, and I thought, yeah, okay, all right, let's run with this. It only took a fraction of the time to set up. It comes with a lot more stuff preloaded on. In fact, I don't even know if I needed to install anything at all. Oh, I installed some of the codecs. Uh, but other than that, Everything that I needed, or everything that would have been needed, so you got your web browser, you got your office utilities, even came with GIMP, so you never know when you need a GIMP, um, and it came so it came with all of those tools preloaded on, and um, they all worked really quite well. In fact, it even came with Chromium BSU, which is a, it's a, a shoot 'em up game, uh, which I did a review of on this channel as well, and that played reasonably well. So. 
uh, I know it's a pretty, I know it's a pretty basic game, but um, yeah, when it you know like everything on it, it worked really quite well. It the laptop I would say was near fully revived. Admittedly, the hardware is still rather old, and it's it's you know ran for a long time and it's had a great deal of use. In fact, some of the keys you can see the F2 key, for example, is you know it's really showing its wear and tear on that one. Whoever used the laptop before I did certainly liked to use the F2 key. So. Uh, all in all, an absolutely wonderful experience with MX Linux yet again. It's the distribution that keeps pleasantly surprising me. Um, lightweight, uh, they still do a 32-bit version for those of you that uh, that are interested in it. It runs XFCE, so it's a re you know, and I consider XFCE to be a reasonably full-featured desktop environment. Uh, it came with the Numix theme in the box. Actually, it comes with a handful of themes on it. Um, one of which was Numix, so I just put the Numix on because that just looks absolutely wonderful. I did turn compositing off because uh, that got the best performance out of it, and it actually runs YouTube videos really well as well. That was sort of my uh, informal benchmark was was just how well YouTube videos play because YouTube it eats up the RAM like nothing else, um, and it's you know it's, YouTube is a heavy website to use, uh, especially if you just use the basic front end through your web browser. Um, and whereas it was, you know, reasonably serviceable through Lubuntu on MX Linux, it was perfectly usable. Um, so yeah, I just you know sort of wanted to share that story of me uh, fixing up this old Advent laptop um, because it was you know it it sort of allowed me to see Linux at a new angle. It allowed me to experience the trolls and tribulations of trying to get Linux to fit around hardware that you didn't buy for it. And um, and I've got to say, it was, it was a bit of a project. Um, but next time that happens, I am going to be giving MX Linux another look. People keep singing its praises, and for damn good reason. So um, all I can say is I hope MX Linux is here to stay, because um, I, I can see myself using it a lot, a lot in the future. Um, I've always liked Debian uh, from a technological standpoint, but Debian does require a little bit of work to get it up to a usable desktop environment, uh, which is fine if you are uh, willing to do so. But uh, you know, I, I I like the easy way. <laughs> Um, it's also given me uh, a bit more curiosity towards the Linux Mint Debian edition as well. Getting a bit closer to Debian just to just to get that little bit of extra speed and uh, you know and to appreciate it. Debian's been around for a long time, and it's a again it's a wonderful piece of technology that a whole host of Linux distributions has uh, you know have been built on. And I think you know uh, Ubuntu have picked up that ball and they ran with it, but. Um, but yeah, like MX Linux have, have stuck with the the Debian stable base, and uh, and they've kept it light, they've kept it functional, they've kept it easy to use. You know what's not to love, eh? What's not to love about it? So um, I think that's about it from me today. Um, uh, just a bit of a a, a bit of a ramble um, because uh, well, you know, this is a video blog, and um, and I just you know you sort of share projects like that on the vi on the uh, on the video blog. I'll actually show you the uh, the laptop is uh, I've got it right here. I'm probably going to be handing it back tomorrow. I think the build quality. I mean, some of the plastic does feel a little bit on the cheap side, but for the overall. Um, quality of it you know it's perfectly usable and you know the previous owners have certainly looked after it so um so that's pretty good and you get about an hour's worth of battery on it so i don't know what it was when it was new but an hour's worth of battery this uh this far down the lines you know i'll take it it's pretty good oh and uh one of the other uh hurdles i had to overcome hardware issue was that the wear and tear of course on the um i've got i'm looking down there at the power supply you know the old brick um it was nothing wrong with it the brick actually worked but you could start seeing where uh some of the wires you know where it was getting a bit um worn you know where the uh, the uh wire sheaths the you know were, were getting a bit worn so i uh you know i made sure to uh to fix them up and, and make sure that they were uh safe um because uh, you know wear and tear uh it happens and uh, and you want to make sure that uh, that you uh yeah you make sure that it's all fixed up and and uh, and good to go so um yeah, all in all, uh, a nice little project for me to work on, and uh, yeah, a laptop that would otherwise be thrown away 
is uh, is now used as an emergency uh, solution in yeah, which is uh, which is great. Um, you know, uh, for those of you that know me quite well, you'll know that I'm very keen on on keeping old stuff alive, and uh, I, you know, I'm a bit of an environmentalist. And and when it comes to technology of this variety, the most environmentally fr friendly technology is the technology that lasts the longest. It's, you know, really is as simple as that. Um, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, carbon emissions that go into to making these things into the production. So the longer you can get out of them, the longer you can put off buying that next model, the better for the for the broadest point. So thank you very much for watching. That's about it for me today. Let me know if you've had similar projects and you've had to overcome similar hurdles uh, down in the comment section below. It's always great to hear Linux stories and. Um, yeah, that's about it for me today. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.